Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay down the back? I'll just check. Right. Oh, I'm getting some, some hands. That's positive. Excellent. Um, well, very warm uh, good afternoon, literally a warm, in fact, good afternoon uh, to all of you here and thank you for attending today's State of the Public Service Roadshow event. My name is Jill Charker and I'm Deputy Secretary Corporate at the Department of Jobs and Small Business and I'll be uh, facilitating the event this afternoon, which is great. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to Elders past and present. I would also like to extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be present with us today as well. Now, many of you will be aware that this event uh, is not just occurring here in person at the Department of Finance, but also is being live streamed. So I would also like to uh, extend a welcome to our colleagues who are participating online. Now, today you'll hear from three uh, quite eminent speakers who will provide an overview and update of the current state of the public service and what it might look like in the future. I'd now like to walk through who, who our speakers are this afternoon and give you a very brief bio about each one and then I'll outline for you the rest of the proceedings this afternoon. So our first speaker this afternoon will be Mr Peter Woolcott, the Australian Public Service Commissioner. He'll deliver an overview of the 2017-18 State of the Service report, including giving you a deep dive into the APS employment data, which is specific to here in the ACT. A little bit about Peter. As you know, he is the Commissioner of the Australian Public Service Commission and commenced in that role in August last year. Peter's had a very distinguished career in the Australian Public Service, serving in senior diplomatic positions around the world, including as Australia's High Commissioner to New Zealand, the Ambassador for the Environment, Permanent Representative to the United Nations in Geneva, Ambassador for Disarmament, Ambassador for People Smuggling Issues and Ambassador to Italy. Most recently, he has served as the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff. I would note that Peter was also appointed an officer in the Order of Australia in 2017 for his distinguished service to public administration in the field of international relations and as a lead negoci negotiator in the non-proliferation and arms control fields. After Peter, we'll be joined by Mr Will Storey, who is a first assistant secretary from the APS review team. And Will will provide us with an update on the independent review of the APS including the learning so far that will inform the review's recommendations to the Australian Government due later this year. Will has nearly 14 years of service in the Prime Minister's and Attorney General's Department and he's taken over the day-to-day -day running of the cross-government team supporting the largest review of Australia's public service in more than 40 years. Will has worked on big public policy projects, including constitutional recognition for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the deregulation agenda, and international litigation for tobacco trade and whaling. Will started as a graduate, in fact, in the Australian Public Service in 2005. He has an undergraduate and master's degree in law and is a member of the elected council that steers the work of the Institute for Public Administration in the ACT. Following Will's presentation, Ms Rena Brunsma, who's a First Assistant Secretary in Public trans Sector Transformation from here at the Department of Finance, will give us a summary of the modernisation work currently being carried out by secretaries through the APS Reform Committee, also known as the ARC or the ARC. Rena, as I noted, is responsible for transformation in the public sector within finance. Her division plays a key role in helping to transform and modernise the Commonwealth public sector, including via initiatives such as the Shared Services Program and through the work of the Secretary's Committee on APS Reform. Before joining finance, Rena was involved in policy development and program implementation that focused on supporting those who are disadvantaged, including people experiencing homelessness, people with disability, including mental health conditions and ex-offenders. Rena's aim is to build, grow and lead high-performing and diverse teams within the APS, providing sound advice to the government of the day and delivering quality outcomes that make a difference in the lives of Australians. So after those three presentations, 
we will then have a question and answer session and the speakers will be joined on stage by Helen Bull, who is the Group Manager for Workforce Information from the Australian Public Service Commission. She has leadership responsibilities for workforce data and research and the APSC's international function. Prior to that role, Helen was responsible for developing and implementing workplace relations policy in the Commonwealth public sector, including providing leadership to a range of Australian government employers negotiating enterprise agreements. Now, the Q&A session with those four uh, colleagues will be facilitated using Slido, which I know many of you will have used before. It's an interactive tool, it's an app, which enables you to submit your questions online. Uh, in the app, you can also view questions submitted by others and give it a thumbs up if you would like to know the answer. I do encourage particularly our colleagues who are viewing this live stream to participate in the Q&A using Slido. Now, if you haven't had a chance to download and log into Slido, the instructions are as you see on the screen and I'll give you a moment to do that right now. For folk who are online, uh, just to confirm, you need to go to www.slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O.com, and we have an event code that you actually need to enter into that website or into the app, which is CBR for Canberra, CBR, dash 1919. So I'll just give, I'll give you about a half a minute to do that if you haven't already. Now, um, I know many of you will be keen to get copies of the presentations, as in the slide presentations, which will be displayed today. I just wanted to reassure you they will be available to download uh, following today's event. Uh, and we'll provide some more instructions about that towards the end of the event this afternoon. So they will be available just to stop people feeling the need to take really detailed notes. So having uh, said all the introductions and given you a sense of what's happening in the next hour or two, uh, we might kick off now. Um, could you join with me please in welcoming our first speaker who is the Australian Public Service Commissioner, Peter Woolcott. Uh, th thank you very much, Jill, for those, uh, those, those kind words and for doing the honours today. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure, a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming out on a sort of muggy day, and thank you all, uh, also those who are listening in on uh, on, the, on on the webcast. I'd also like to welcome those agency heads who have joined us here today, and, and thank you also for coming. So let me begin by reiterating Jill's acknowledgement of country and acknowledge the, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, and pay my respect to elders, past and present. I'd like to welcome you to the State of the Public Service Roadshow. This is the first, as, or my first, as Australian Public Service Commissioner. And today's events will provide an overview of the key themes and findings from the State of the Service Report of, of 2017-18. As Jill mentioned, it'll dive into specific employment data for the APS in Canberra, and hopefully it'll also provide you with insight into what will be forthcoming in the year ahead. It is already clear that 2019 will be a busy year. Apart from the array of issues facing government, there'll be a federal election and a strong focus on the reform of the APS to ensure it's fit for purpose in the years ahead. A high performing APS is crucial to the good governance and prosperity of Australia. The report highlights the changing APS context and echoes the views of the chair of the APS review, David Thody. The Australian Public Service is not broken, but it does need to be ready to respond quickly to government, changing community expectations, and the sheer pace of technological change. Like many other institutions in Western democracies, the APS faces significant challenges. Change is coming, and we'll need to adapt and become far more agile in the way we work. The government and the APS are grappling with the challenges posed by the complexity and interconnectedness of issues, globalisation and shifting power relativities and technology. A number of global and local trends have implications for the future of the APS workforce. These include a decline in public trust, an ageing workforce, and the rise of the digital economy, globalisation and artificial intelligence. New ways of working 
better use of data and harnessing new technologies will help to drive a more responsive public service. While accelerated change is needed, this needs to be managed carefully. The government and the public still want a sense of continuity and stability from the APS. Services and regulatory functions still need to be delivered and sound advice provided. The 21st uh, State of the Service report was released in, uh, in late 2018. Its release came against the backdrop of a major focus on reform and how to prepare the APS for the future. We have two reform processes currently underway. Modernising the public service through the work of the Secretary's APS Reform Committee and the independent review of the APS led by David Thody. The Government will be presented with a Thody review on the future of the public service in mid-2019. It will make recommendations designed to ensure the APS is relevant and fit for purpose in the coming decades. And as Jill said, this will be the most comprehensive review of the APS since the Coombs Royal Commission in 1976. An extraordinary amount of detailed work is going into this review. Will Story from the APS review team will speak about his progress later in today's presentation. And Rena Brinsman from the Department of Finance will then provide us with an update on work being undertaken by secretaries through the APS Reform Committee or ARC process to modernise the service and focus on better delivery of services for Australians. My strong sense is that these two streams of work reinforce each other and will mark a watershed for public administration in Australia. You can be cynical and point out that we've seen some 18 public reviews over the past 15 years and that many of these recommendations have essentially been put on bookshelves. What I think is different now is that firstly, there's a deep conversation around change inside the APS leadership, amongst the political class and amongst commentators. And this has taken on a momentum of its own. And secondly, we live in such times that the technological, societal and political factors driving change will be irresistible. I think it is also important to distinguish reforms that require government action and those that can be implemented by the APS itself. There's much we can do ourselves regarding stewardship, structure, accountability, one APS, talent and capability management. Now, the State of the Service Report centres on three themes reflecting the high level of workforce components necessary to ensure the APS is fit for purpose, both now and into the future. These themes are leadership, capability and culture. But before getting into these themes, let me paint a quick picture of the APS itself. There are 150,594 employees in the APS working across Australia and overseas. The most common job family of employees in the APS is service delivery, with 25% of employees saying they worked in that field, followed by almost 15% who nominated compliance and regulation. 105 APS agencies and authorities deliver a range of services. The size and shape of the APS is constantly changing. One factor changing the APS is that our workforce is steadily ageing. In the last 10 years, the mean age of APS employees has increased from 41.4 years to 43.4 years. On a global scale, by 2025, millennials will make up 75% of the global workforce. Now, some data about the APS in Canberra. 38% or 57,115 APS employees work in Canberra. Nationally, 90% of, of the APS workforce in ongoing roles with only 3,135 in non-ongoing roles. 84 of the 105 APS agencies are based in Canberra. And there are, of course, distinct differences, as you would appreciate, between Canberra and the regions in the type of work performed and the workforce itself. Effort in the regions is largely focused on service delivery. And just over 11% of staff in the ACT work in policy development compared to less than 1% of staff outside of Canberra. The most common job found of employees in Canberra is ICT, with 13% of employees saying they worked in that field, followed by 12% working in administrative roles. This is a reflection of the departments with the largest presence in Canberra, being defence, home affairs, human services, health and industry innovation and science. In Canberra, 57% of the APS workforce is female compared to 59% nationally. 
This proportion has remained reasonably stable over the past, uh, over the, uh, past decade. Public servants in Canberra are the youngest in the country with an average age of 41.7 years. Now let me return to the three fit themes and start with leadership. Strong leadership is critical to APS performance. There's an expectation that leadership is exercised at a range of levels in the APS. In the 2018 APS employee census, employees rated their supervisors favorably on all questions. The strongest positive response was to the question of whether their senior executive manager is of high quality. In Canberra, 73% agreed that my SES manager, my SES manager, is of a high quality, compared to 65% across the APS. Nationally, employees were less likely to agree that their senior executives across the organisation work as a team. With strong and united leadership being a key driver in managing change and driving performance, I see this as an area for improvement. Agencies have provided feedback that a priority area for capability development is leadership, specifically in resilience and change management. This feedback recognises the rapidly changing context in which the APS operates. Similarly, submissions to the independent review of the APS have emphasised the importance of leadership in the future due to the competition for talent that will occur. Key characteristics discussed include a more inclusive leadership style, where alternative viewpoints are sought, delegation is undertaken effectively, and measured risk taking is encouraged. Additionally, the development of soft skills is vital for senior officials. How the APS best develops the leadership capability of employees in the future will be an area of focus for the independent review of the APS. And the APSC is playing a key role in supporting this work. The 2017-18 State of the Service report highlights, with regard to capability, that building capability for the future is a must. The nature of work is changing with rapid advances in computer power and data growth, advances in artificial intelligence, digitalization and automation. In this increasingly digital world, digital skills, data analysis and reporting have been highlighted by agencies as a priority area for capability development. Agencies across the service recognise this, having provided us with feedback that their top learning and development needs was to improve digital literacy. At the same time, the APS will continue to acquire professional public service capabilities, such as policy expertise, <coughs> to de deliver to the standards government and citizens expect. I'm also conscious of the critical importance of the need to value operational, commercial, financial and technical skills as highly as policy skills. I suspect that many problems could have been prevented if operational and technical teams had the same access to decision makers as those with policy skills. As I've outlined, a high performing public sector is demonstrated by its ability to influence and deliver on government outcomes. Performance is driven by its leadership and enabled by its systems, processes and governance. The capabilities required to be an effective APS are not static and we must continuously renew and refresh our ability to provide expert advice on policy and effective services to the public. The APS also needs to continuously develop its workforce and enable employees to move freely both within and throughout the system. However, from the census data, we know that only 2.7% of the APS moves to different agency each year. The Canberra mobility rate is double this at 5.4%. Nearly half of the APS workforce in Canberra has worked in more than one agency, compared to just over a quarter nationally. Our analysis shows that most movements between agencies are in Canberra, and most of these are to agencies focused on developing policy. It is also worth noting that a quarter of externally hired SES leave within two years, and 92% of promotions in 2017 were internal. This points to another issue. The APS must be more permeable and mobile in order to foster diversity of thinking and contestability of ideas and assist in capability development. But we need to think about mobility from an organisational or system perspective. We need a balance. Too much or poorly targeted mobility can have an adverse impact and we can lose subject matter expertise. 
Technical expertise plays a part in the employee's mobility, with people working in a more technical or specialised role less likely to have worked for multiple agencies. There are challenges to building capability for the future, and the need for a comprehensive workforce strategy is a key part of our thinking. The APS will need to build new skill sets in multiple areas ranging from data analytics through to project management and cyber security. And in developing these strategies, we'll need to work out how we train and retain our existing talent. Now, moving on to the culture of the APS, to build a, a trusted and effective APS, a foundational set of values and behaviours must underpin our culture. A culture that reflects a professional public service and maintains a strong focus on integrity. We need to demonstrate high levels of personal integrity while adhering to the APS values and code of conduct. These behaviours are essential in building relationships with the community and the government of the day. They have always been, they have, these have always been important, and they are especially so today in the face of declining public trust. Our data indicates that the APS operates with strong integrity and low level of corruption. There are notable declines in perceived bullying and harassment, with current levels too high, but still the lowest since 2015. A very small number of employees, 72 in the APS of some 150,000 plus, were found to have breached the code of conduct for behaviour that could have been categorised as corrupt. The APS is well regarded by international benchmarks and peers for its integrity processes and structures. There can, however, be no complacency. It is difficult to build trust and all too easy to lose it. Openness of government, transparency in decision making and management of information are all foundational to our APS culture. In the APS today, we need to more actively engage with risk, which will enable us to embrace innovation. Risk management, innovation and effective change management are interrelated cultural factors that heavily influence the way agencies operate and their ability to adapt. It is widely seen that the APS is risk averse. Our data provides some further insights. Most employees agree that their agency supports escalation of risks and that risk related concerns are discussed openly and honestly. However, less than half agree that employees in their agency had the right skills to manage risk effectively, that appropriate risk taking was re rewarded, and when things went wrong, their agency used it as an opportunity to review, learn and improve. Along with risk management, change management is also an area for further improvement. This view is shared both by employees and their agencies. In this year's employee census, just over a third of employees agreed that change is managed well. When agencies were last asked about their change management capability in 2017, 80%, 87% identified the need to improve. Now, on diversity, we continue to see a positive trend in the diversity of the APS. Work groups and supervisors are perceived to be accepting an understanding of diversity and inclusion more broadly. Agencies are working well to improve awareness of Indigenous culture in the workplace. There's a focus on expanding the range of Indigenous employment opportunities and increasing the representation of Indigenous employees in senior roles. In other, in other welcome news, the census results highlight that the experience of LGBTI staff is broadly positive and the number of women in SES roles is at its highest since 2000. As I've noted earlier, our workforce is steadily ageing. In the last 10 years, the mean age of APS employees has increased to 43.4 years. And in the future, we'll need to appeal to both a young workforce, but also an ageing population through flexibility and meaningful work. Increasing the diversity of the workforce is also important if the APS is to effectively serve a diverse Australian community. We need to reflect the nation that we are, built around diversity and fortified by tolerance. People who come to Australia from other countries come for a reason to better themselves and their families. They often come from countries where opportunities are limited and governance is poor. They do not take what Australia offers for granted and they do not take good governance for granted. The immigrant journey leads them to work hard and seize the opportunity that is in front of them. We need and want the APS to reflect this diversity. At the moment, we fall short. Cultural and linguistically diverse groups comprise a significant proportion of Australia's population. 26% of Australians were born overseas and 21% of Australians speak a language other than English at home. 
In comparison, a lower proportion of respondents to the 2018 APS employee census, 22% reported being born overseas, and 18% reported speaking a language other than English at home. Another area we must maintain our focus is disability. In 2018, just 3.7% of employees recorded having a disability in their agency HR systems. This contrasts with 8.7% of employees reporting having a disability in the confidential APS census. By either measure, the APS is still not reflecting the Australian community, where one in five Australians live with disability. We continue to work with agencies and employers to improve this performance and to ensure our systems and cultures do not stand in the way of people with disability to have fulfilling APS careers. The State of the Service Report 2017-18 highlights that public trust in governments in many countries, including Australia, is in decline. The report references the Edelman Trust Barometer, an annual online survey of trust in 28 markets around the world. In 2018, Australia ranked 19th across the 28 countries assessed, with an overall score of 35% trust in all the three levels of Australian government, well below the average of 43%. On a slightly more positive note, the recently released 2019 Edelman Trust Barometer reported an improvement in Australia's trust in government service so in Australia's in government score, which is now closer to the global average. David Thody raises the idea the APS needs to be a trusted partner of the government and the Australian people. We know that trust is influenced by citizens' experiences in receiving government services, the level of citizen engagement we pursue, and whether we're inclusive in designing policy, appropriate regulation, and the integrity of institutions. In my opinion, trust increases when there is a heightened sense of mutual respect. Our job as Australian public servants is to help government effectively and efficiently meet the hopes and aspirations of the Australian people. If we do this well, we, build, we will build trust in the service. We also need to hold on to the concept that Australians are citizens and connected to government, not simply the consumers of what it has to offer. We need to hold on to the idea that government and the APS should serve the people in pursuit of the collective good. In line with building trust, we also need to get better at building our brand, to get better at speaking about the spirit of public service that drives us to achieve results, and to develop new and diverse ways of delivering policies and services that make a difference to people's lives. And to further an understanding of just how vast the work of the APS is, from helping drought-stricken farmers in central New South Wales to geospatial intelligence and data mining, gathering Australian border and cyber intelligence, right through to establishing the National Disability Insurance Scheme. I've asked the APS to publicly share our stories of success, innovation and change across uh, the APS. Let me wrap up by saying that the fundamental purpose of government is to keep the Australian people safe and to keep Australia prosperous. Government pr promotes laws and regulations. It provides services that the private sector cannot or would not provide, ranging from medical payments through to food safety standards and diplomatic consular services. It also manages risk in a myriad of ways, ranging from terrorist attacks through to financial crises, including those risks that flow from not doing something either through neglect or failure to reform, which leaves us poorer or more vulnerable. It is good government and a professional APS which makes all the bad things less likely to occur and the good things more likely to do so. And I've said before, it is the quality of governance that sets nations apart. The APS faces real challenges in managing a complex future where the expectations of government and the expectations of the public have never been higher. This is why reform will be critical to what unfolds over the year. The State of the Service Report reflects a workforce that well understands its role in serving the government and the Australian people and prides itself on a strong track record of delivering outcomes. It also reflects a workforce that understands the nature of the reform path we need to go down. So on that note, I'll conclude my presentation and hand over to Will Story, and thank you very much. Thanks so much, Peter. That was a really great overview of some data and some really nice slices of the data for those of us in ACT as well. Um, if you have any questions for Peter, just a reminder, don't forget to post them on Slido. So hopefully you've all got that now and uh, hopefully questions are rolling in. 
So on that note, I'd like to now invite our next speaker to the stage, Will Storey from the APS review team in PM&C. Could you join with me in welcoming him, please? Uh, th thank you very much, Jill. And uh, let me just join uh, Jill in acknowledging the traditional owners of uh, this land, the Ngunnawal people, uh, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Uh, and let me extend that respect to uh, any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Uh, or listening online, you're a critical part of our service and uh, it's, it's important that, that we have you, that we make the most of you and that this service does what it needs for you. Look, thank you for all of you for coming today. It's a pleasure to, uh, to join Peter and, and Rena on the stage. And uh, in a way, it's symbolic, I think, of uh, that watershed moment uh, in, in public reform that, that we may face here where we've got a, 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 an active uh, commissioner, the Department of Finance is driving alongside a, a group of interested and dedicated secretaries a reform program and we've got a significant uh, resourced review of the public sector uh, commissioned by the government to prepare us for the future. And those conjunction of forces give us a window of opportunity to make genuine change uh, in our service, not for our sake but, but for the sake of, our, of the Australian people for an hour, and for our role in the country. Look, um, I guess you've got a bit of a sense of, of me, uh, but, but a description of bios doesn't tell you all that much, does it? Um, so I, was, I thought I'd share one thing, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sense that uh, I think many of you share. Um, I, I came to, to Canberra from Brisbane I, uh, for, to work at the Attorney General's Department to do a, an arcane area of law that I felt was, was important and passionate, and, and, and to be honest, Canberra's the only place you can do it. Uh, I, I had no intention of joining the APS and uh, it was only about five or six or so years later that I started changing the uh, profession that you write down when you, you, you enter or, or leave a country from lawyer, which was sort of my identity, I guess, to, to public servant. And I can remember that point and uh, I felt quite proud of that and that spirit of service, I guess, had, had inculcated it into myself. And uh, you can see that reflected in this comment from David Thody. Uh, David Thody is the chair of the APS review panel uh, and he expresses a, a genuine sentiment that the APS review panel has been struck with. The panel is made up of six individuals. Uh, it's got me members have public sector, deep public sector experience, academic insights and private sector insights and, and non-government experience as well. They bring a lot to us but uh, what they bring fundamentally is a deep passion for the APS and what it can achieve. And above all, as, as David indicates, I, th I think they've been impressed by the spirit of service that they see in all of their interactions with you. Now, this review was set up to uh, ensure the APS for, is fit for purpose for coming decades. Uh, and that's no mean feat, of course, um, uh, and, uh, but it's one that can only be achieved collectively, not by the review, but by you. So let me give you some numbers to just start out and to help you frame where we're at. 2030, that's the year that the APS's review has grounded its analysis upon. 118 is the, that's the number of years since we were created as, uh, alongside the, the uh, Commonwealth of Australia. 42, look, today it's not the meaning of life, but rather the number of years since the Coombs review, which was the last, ma last major or large scale review of our service. And, uh, many, of what, many of the structures and uh, systems that it recommended uh, are what we live with today. 1,300 is the number of substantial, uh, thoughtful engagements that the review panel has had, give or take. Uh, but they range from submissions to face-to-face -face meetings, workshops, uh, and, uh, and an extensive amount of online consultation. Eight, that's the number of states and territories. It's also the number of states and territories that the review panel uh, has visited, as well as some international jurisdictions. Uh, and finally, 4,800. Um, that's the number of people who right now are subscribing. And uh, I reckon I can see about 200 in the audience. So my challenge today uh, is to get up to 5,000. Uh, so www.apsreview, get, get on board. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the website at the end. Um, one more number, two, um, the government and the opposition have both welcomed this review. Uh, I wouldn't have ordinarily mentioned that, but it's often the, uh, the first question that we've been asked. Uh, and fair enough, I can see why. 
Look, uh, let, me, let me start with the APS's, APS review panel's vision for this service in 2030. Uh, the panel has talked to a lot of people, it's heard from a lot of people, it's spent six months listening. Uh, and in, in November, David Thody shared uh, the panel's vision for the service. It's one that's united in a collective endeavour, that's a trusted and respected partner, that's dynamic, uh, agile, resilient or flexible, one that's an employer of choice that's great to work for, and one that is a global leader in public service that's excellent at what we do. Uh, I want to explore each of those really quickly and then, me, then, then let me come back to why the panel set that vision and, and some thoughts about how collectively we're going to try and get the answer about how to get there. Look, first, United in Service. At its heart, this is about unity and across the service and why we do what we do together. Uh, we talk about a concept of one APS and it, it may be a concept we talk more about in, in theory than live in practice. Uh, the review panel has been struck by the opportunity that a genuinely operationalising that concept of one APS could have for our effectiveness, our efficiency uh, and, and the impact that we can make for Australia. Uh, David Thody has discussed the need for a common purpose, a clearly defined purpose across the service, a vision for the APS, a, a, a service that confidently serves the people of Australia, the long-term interests of the country, that defaults to working together and contesting ideas, not defending agency interests, and a service in which we can work easily across different subject matters, that we can bring the right skills, insights and perspectives to solve the problems for us. The panel has been struck by an observation that 50% of you in the service see your primary home as the APS and 50% see your primary home, your primary point of allegiance as your agency. The panel has been struck by stories of uh, coordination comments that seek to defend an agency interest, not prosecute the national interest. The panel has talked about the APS being a trusted and respected partner. Uh, to be trusted, you need to earn trust. You need to be worthy of trust. You can't just build it. Uh, the panel's view is that in 2030, we search for and we draw on different perspectives. That we've got the capability to engage genuinely with the industry sectors that we engage with. That comes to uh, community engagement, to service delivery with the people of Australia, with a sense of service, uh, a sense of humility. Uh, an APS where we pick up the phone and share what we know and we crowdsource and shape solutions. Another important point, a no regrets action, whatever happens, is that we need, we've got 150,000 odd people. You're not all odd, it's a turn of phrase. <laughs> Sorry, that's a cheap joke. <laughs> we've got 150,000 odd people, we've got a significant investment in us. Now are we ca capitalising on that significant investment to deliver for the people of Australia now and in the long term? So when it comes to the flexible, this is about how we work. It's about the systems and structures that are stable, enabling platforms that let us get on and do our job, that avoid the frustrations that, that we sometimes have. So in 2030, the whole system is turned towards the people we serve. We anticipate and seize opportunities. We're adaptable. We make the most of all the technology offers for us. We find it easier to deploy the right talent, talent uh, and the right skills to new priorities. Now, there's a huge appetite in the service for making this happen, for looking at our rules, the culture, incentives, funding models, even the way we consider risk. And one of the first things that the, the panel said was that we need to be an employer of choice. And, you know, it's an old phrase, it's a common phrase. And essentially what sits behind that is that the APS is nothing more than a collection of a lot of people that's motivated to serve the people of Australia. Uh, and so we need to look after that talent. We need to be great to work for because that's how you get great people. Uh, our panel wants the public service, wants public service to be a badge of honour, one that's highly prized by employers. So we recruit the people we need at different levels. We invest in our people. We use their skills well. We've got a professional perspective and we've got personal perspectives. We always assess how we stack up. We're always evolving. Finally, the APS has made clear that we need to have a high aspiration 
for the excellence of what we do. Now, not benchmarked against some OECD rankings or some rankings come out of the University of Oxford, but rather that we have an excellence mindset, that we're resolutely focused on doing the very best that we collectively can for the people of Australia. So in 2030, we'll do great work for those people of Australia. Our policies will stand the test of time. Regulations will work. They'll enable people to get the right things done. They'll improve quality of life. They'll create opportunities. Our services will be easy to use. We'll have one-stop shops where we need them. Uh, the internet will be easy to access. It'll meet the needs of those who, who use them and be delivered seamlessly. So look, I guess, you know, that's the end game. That's the vision. And it's, it's good to talk about visions because uh, that's where we need to get to. But uh, I recall working uh, for Roger Wilkins, the Secretary of uh, Attorney General's Department. He had a, a neat turn of phrase and, and he said to me, uh, well, visions are what uh, bearded men had in the desert uh, 2,000 years ago. So it's not all about visions. You, you've got to start somewhere else. You know? So let me start with the, the case for change, the reason that, that we need to change. So I guess the question is, do we need to change? You know, do we just need to optimise what we've got or is it deeper? The, reviews, the review panel's perspective on this is pretty clear. I think the change is required. Change is to, to set us up uh, to be fit for purpose for coming decades. The review panel has put it in three ways. At its heart, the case of change is that the world is changing. It has changed, but it will change more. The APS will deal with more and more complex problems. The APS will need to keep up with the rapidly changing uh, nature of citizen expectations. Uh, it'll need to uh, operate in an environment in which the opportunities and implications of technology are enormous, both at a, an economy or society-wide level, but also for how we do our business. Political power, the nature of political power is changing, and that changes our role. Trust in government is changing. Trust in the APS too. And, and internationally, there are significant geopolitical shifts which are changing the environment that we operate in every day. So the question then is, if we need to change, are we change ready? Are we change fit? I think one of the APS review panel's observations is that some of our systems and structures and culture and processes don't allow us to adapt and respond as quickly, as nimbly or as effectively as we need to. And I guess that brings us to the other part of the case for change is that the review panel has heard veins of frustration. Uh, so let me start, I guess, with the present and then um, put forward to the future. Let's talk about some of those frustrations. It's not just the service who's reflected these, it's, it's the, the public and those partners that this uh, panel works with. Some of this feedback says that we're reactive, we lack confidence. The priorities we work to can sometimes feel like they're all over the place. They're not dictated by uh, overall outcomes for Australia, but, but rather inconsistent agency interests. There's a view that sometimes structures and rules and processes can get in the way of people doing things, not enable them to get stuff done. Some of our relationships are fragile, uh, whether with the people we serve, with the government, or with the partners that, that we work on uh, significant projects with. Uh, we've got a great... Um, we, we recruit great grads, but, you know, do we struggle to... Uh, we sometimes we struggle to get, re recruit, and keep and develop all of the talent that we need. Um, and I guess there's a sense underpinning that, this is David Thody put it, that of people feeling like they're not meeting their potential here and they can't do their best work here. And it matches up with some of the uh, evidence in the APS survey, which says one of the significant reasons people leave us is not for money, but because they don't have their professional needs and their aspirations satisfied right here. Uh, and an environment when we'll be working with 75% uh, with of the workforce by 2025, which suddenly isn't all that far away, will be millennials uh, and, and a significant, would also need to work with a, an ageing uh, workforce, will need that degree of flexibility and uh, uh, um, ambition for, for our work meaningfulness uh, to really drive engagement and, and how we work. Let me come to the next point, um, which is more about the future. There's a prevailing challenge at the moment, which is that we're in a low trust environment. Uh, and that Australia is at presently one of the least trusting countries in the OECD. And as trust declines, so does, it, so does satisfaction with democracy. Trust has been defined as choosing to make something important to us 
vulnerable to the actions of someone else. And that gets to the very heart of what government do, what government does. We have great responsibility for the lives of people, uh, for their data, for their hopes and aspirations, for their families, for their daily, uh, for their, their fortnightly income. Uh, and if we don't have trust, we're not going to be able to do uh, the sort of great work we need to do. Uh, so we don't need to build trust, we need to earn it. We've got to be worthy of it. And finally, I've mentioned before some of these external forces that are changing our world. Trust is one of those, but there are others. The expectations of the people we serve are changing, they're rising. New technologies is remaking our lives. It offers enormous opportunities to do work better. Uh, it also changes, has significant implications for our workforce and reskilling. Societies are shifting within their borders and countries are changing in their relationship to each other. And finally, workplaces and jobs are adjusting, as is the way we work. Now, each of these shifts relate to each other. Each have tipping points. We don't know precisely how it's going to play out. We can't predict the future, but we've got a plan for it. I guess that's the, the very uh, reason for, this, for the uh, APS review's uh, existence. We have done one interesting piece of work. Uh, we've commissioned BCG to talk to you uh, and, and try to define what different scenarios could be the, for the future. I'd encourage you to get onto our website and, and check that out. Uh, and what it's great is it effectively crowdsources ideas of 2,700 public servants uh, for, uh, to, to help us understand our present and emerging uh, challenges in our operating environment. I guess what's important tonight is that we can equip ourselves to adjust, to use different tools in different ways, to take the reins. We, I guess the simple point is there. It's a, it's a choice. So where to next? Well, um, if I get the slide up next, this is the plan. Can you make that out? Have you got that? <laughs> Sorry, uh, another cheap joke, actually. Look, um, it's the plan, or at least it's the start of one, the one. Um, the, the APS review panel is, in fact, meeting today. And uh, I've, I actually drive down from Sydney, where it was meeting, uh, to, to see you. Uh, and so right now, the, the panel is working through a whole bunch of ideas and actions. Uh, it's, it's working through the case of change and, and its vision uh, for the APS. Uh, there are a whole bunch of ideas floating around uh, and the panel intends to uh, share many of those with you in mid-March uh, uh, at a, um, uh, an event here in Canberra and online with a whole bunch of supporting materials which gives a gr much greater real sense of its priorities for change, the reform priorities, what needs to be done to achieve that, uh, that vision. So I guess I can't say too much, and that'll probably remain um, a little opaque for the moment. Um, but, but let me give you a sense of some of these significant points that, that are clear in the panel's thinking. The first is that uh, some of the, the actions relate to how we deliver for the long term. The question about the degree to which we're responsive and the degree to which we're confident in delivering what we need to do now uh, and, and in future governments, giving us a clear role as, as stewards of the APS. Uh, and operationalising that, creating a mechanism to spot emerging challenges, follow clear national interests, honing in on APS employee value proposition, what, what's in it for you, uh, professionalising the service, building our capability. Uh, the idea is to get us working together outside government with partners, but within government too. It comes to questions about operating model, uh, resourcing, uh, and how we're, we're set up to, um, for agile organisations. There's plenty of ideas there, and what I'd encourage you to do is to get online. You can, you can see some of the panel's thinking, uh, and you can engage with that. And I'd encourage you to put your thoughts in now. Uh, and then in mid-March, the panel, as I said, will share its priorities for change. Uh, and we want you to get involved. Uh, I guess one fundamental point is that uh, Change doesn't happen because it's written up in a, in a beautiful book on the, the bookshelf. And I've got a few of those in, in uh, actually, I don't have a bookshelf because uh, we have a flexible work environment, but um, <laughs> it's in my locker. It's not quite the same, uh, is it? But um, in my locker, there are a number of these old reports. And I guess the, this fundamental point emerges for us. Many of those recommendations are, are sensible. Uh, uh, and I guess the point for us is, collectively, we need to own this. And we need to make that sort of change. Um, uh, and I guess it's, it's going to be hard. It's not, not always easy to make change. Organisations are difficult things. You know, they're difficult beasts to wrestle with. Uh, but the, the point that, the, that David Thody has picked up on and that, that's clear to us in all our interactions is that that spirit of service, 
is an incredible advantage that we have over just about every one of our private sector uh, comparators. So, as I said, the panel uh, is approach here is about forming and testing ideas. And it's in that process that we'll come up with better ones and, and critically that we'll get that sort of sense, that context uh, for change. So I look forward to your questions today. Uh, but more importantly, when you get out of this room, I really want you to get onto that review website. If you can crack 5,000, then we'll be doing well. Um, you can vote, you can leave a comment, you can add to the picture that we have already. Uh, and secondly, uh, I, I do encourage you to engage with the panel's ideas that, that it shares in, in March. And that's the next opportunity to get really test the ideas. Are they transformative enough? Do we have what we need to make them stick? So this review success is defined by you, uh, by our panel's ability to push the right buttons and, and then by the actions that collectively we take as a service to do what we can to achieve more for the Australian people. Um, and with that, I think it's a wonderful time to, to hand to Rena, who's, uh, as I said, part of the, uh, this watershed moment in, in public service reform. Thank you. Thanks so much, Will, and uh, really great to get that strong theme from your presentation about um, the extent to which the review is really seeking to get input from us in the public service. It's not purely a distant, disconnected process. It's very much the opposite of that. So would strongly echo Will's um, suggestion to subscribe to what's happening, uh, because actually a lot is happening and will continue to, uh, and take up every opportunity to get involved when you can, uh, because the panel actually does want to hear what we think as practitioners on the ground uh, and we have I think a tremendous opportunity to contribute. So thank you again Will, much appreciated. So finally in terms of our speakers could you please now join with me in welcoming Rena Brunsma from the Department of Finance. Thanks Jill. Okay, um, my parents uh, came to Australia with my grandparents after the First, uh, the Second World War. I was going to say the First World War. They're not that old. Um, <laughs> it was the Second World War, um, and so I, I really wanted to frame my acknowledgement to the traditional custodians in the gratitude that we feel in being able to make uh, Australia our home. So acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Ngunnawal people, and uh, paying my respects to their elders, past and present, and extending these respects to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. So what I'm going to be talking about today is what's already going on in the public sector. So we have a plan uh, for um, building a vision for 2030, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing going on right now. And when we think about the concept of change, we've been talking about change this morning, some people can feel a bit over it, like, oh, okay, we've had enough of that already. Um, but human beings are actually, you know, we're built for resilience and for change. And we're changing all the time. So I asked my team to come up with a couple of photographs to demonstrate this for you. So here we have some photographs of the public sector of the past. And the one I'd like to particularly draw your attention to is the brochure on the, um, the side, which is come and join us in Canberra. I, we picked this one specially for you, Canberra. Um, it's a brochure that was designed to attract uh, women to come to Canberra to join the public service. And you'll see that uh, they are encouraging people to look at jobs as typists, stenographers, and I was so pleased to see as secretaries. <laughs> Of course, uh, we're making our way to the future. Um, I've just grabbed a little quote from uh, um, PwC on one of the mega trends that, that we're facing in terms of um, adapting ourselves so that we're fit for purpose for the future. And that's the digital revolution, which has no boundaries or borders. It is changing behaviour and expectations as much as the tools used to deliver new services and experiences. So just a taste of the, the, the environment around us which we're um, grappling to keep up with. You may have heard me talk about this one before, so the Modernising the Public Sector Roadmap in my favourite publication, the preface to budget paper number four, uh, we started to map out uh, what is it that we want to do while the um, review is coming up with its findings to put us on the right path. And this is being led by the Secretary's APS Reform Committee. So my secretary, Rosemary Huxtable, is the chair of that committee. And I have to say that she and her colleagues 
actually really do carve out serious time um, and commit uh, resources to this work. So it may not be visible to some of you, um, but I have to say that there's a group of secretaries who are really committed to um, trying to make the most of uh, the, ch trying to drive change and to oversight some of the change initiatives. Um, so the narrative uh, that they're working to was articulated in BP4, and so you don't have to read BP4 because I know you all love it. Um, we summarised it for you. So really what we're looking at and what the secretaries have agreed as our narrative is that we really want to focus on making it easier for citizens and businesses to engage with government. That's why we as a service exist. Um, but we also need to um, focus on how we, as the public sector, can meet the, their growing expectations in the most efficient way possible. So there's two sides of the story. One is a very outward-facing story that means that we're providing services to Australians, um, and the other one is that we, as a service, are doing so in a way that uh, makes the most of our limited resources. The roadmap uh, includes a number of initiatives that were announced in the budget and they generally focus on the customer service experience. So we know that DHS has major programs of work in relation to um, welfare payment transformation. We've got veteran-centric reform. We've got a number of big projects that are actually really focusing on how customers engage with government. On the other hand, um, there are 42 projects that were funded under the Modernisation Fund. So um, about two years ago, the government invested $500 million into uh, initiatives that will help us as a public service to modernise, and there's 42 projects that are underway. Uh, in addition, the secretaries thought, well, what are the other things that we should and could be doing um, that don't need a government mandate and potentially we could do within existing resources? And there are 24 further projects that the secretaries have identified that are up and running um, and a number of you or your agencies might be involved in them to continue to drive reform. So what I thought I would do today um, is talk, I'll take a couple of examples of the projects that are underway to give you a sense of things already happening and opportunities that you have to get involved. Um, when you bring it back to, you know, why am I talking about this and, you know, why should all, any of us care? Um, I think that when we talk about change and we talk about transformation, we're also talking about opportunities. So there's opportunities for every one of us to build new skills. We know that um, the, the way that the workforce operates at the moment, it's no longer the same job for life. So it's about learning new skills and adapting uh, and growing, exploring new ways of working, trying something new, um, taking on a little bit more of an innovative or uh, an approach that accepts a little bit more risk creating, as I said, the culture of innovation, improving communication in our networks and freeing up the time that we spend on the things that aren't necessarily adding value to focus on the things that really add value and that, and that really do encourage us to provide better services to citizens and to businesses outside of the service. So what I'm hoping today, I'll take you through a couple of the projects and I hope that that's going to give you ideas to take back to your organisation, perhaps inspire you a little bit, um, but also highlight some opportunities where you can learn from one another and you can feed back into um, the conversation about how, how are we going to change and what can we do and some of the exciting things that some of you are already doing. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is GovTeams. Now, many of you will have heard of GovTeams, but I'm sure that some of you have not. Um, so GovTeams is an online collaboration platform. And the great thing about GovTeams is that it's not limited to talking and collaborating with people in your department. You can collaborate online with people in other departments and agencies and even people external to the public service. So it's in its beta stage at the moment, but you can log on and you can sign up and you can and start using it now. So I'm just going to give you a little video that gives you a sense about what GovTeams is all about. Ah, oh, meetings. Oh, I forgot my meeting. Oh, I've got a meeting. Can we chat? No, I've got a meeting, sorry. Do you have time to talk? Oh, it's the meeting. The meeting. To work better together, we need to talk about things, but finding the right people, place and time is never easy. We work better as a team, so we've built GovTeams, it brings people, conversations and content together and provides tools to collaborate with colleagues and your industry partners across network boundaries. Connect on the go by video, audio or instant messaging. 
Plus, you can share and co-author files and more. Make private communities or thriving ones that can be joined by everyone. Now you have an individual profile that will stay with you throughout your APS career and will help people find you. And we've created a personalised dashboard that suggests communities you might want to connect with and information based on your interests. Plus all the other features you assumed you'd never get. You can even reconnect with mates from back in the day. GovTeams is designed by us for us, so help us build it. We'll be improving it based on your feedback. Join up and get started so you can meet properly and work how you wish you could. GovTeams, work better together. Okay, so that is GovTeams. A few instructions on how to get there. So to, to register for GovTeams, you need to go to www.govteams.gov.au. We've actually started a community in there to um, encourage a conversation about modernising the public sector. So when you go into GovTeams, you can search for modernising the public sector, which is a community, so the big tile in the, in the first screenshot. Um, you can launch that. And then once you're there, we're actually going to start a conversation after today's presentation. We'll load the presentation up there. But we'd really love you to go online and give your thoughts and feedback about the presentation, but just to actually get going and have give Gov Teams a go. So a lot of the uh, teams in finance are already thinking about, okay, now that we have this tool, how are we going to use it in our just our day-to-day -day work? So we've started a, a whole of sector conversation, but you can start conversations or you can start communication communities that are just based on the work that you do. And you'll be able to see a whole range of, um, in, when you go in there, you'll be able to see a whole range of tiles and ideas about how people are using the GovTeams community. So I really encourage you to uh, go online. So the next project that I want to talk about is called the uh, Productivity Automation Centre of Excellence. So this is something that's being driven through the Secretary's APS Reform Committee. And um, I think you, all of us hear a lot now about process automation. And sometimes it can be a bit daunting because I've heard people say, oh my goodness, the robots are coming. It's not that at all. Um, so I thought I'd probably dispel a few myths today, but also give you um, some ideas about how you can use process automation. And the PACE, the Productivity Automation Centre of Excellence, is really bringing together a community of excellence and practice across the public service uh, around process automation. So a lot of departments have, are starting to build a capability. It's bringing all those departments together, really growing that capability and making sure that we're all learning and uh, learning from one another. So the PACE is located in the service delivery office, which is one of the shared services centres, um, but we're partnering with uh, other agencies like the ATO, DHS and, and some of the other agencies that are playing in the process automation space. So when you think about automation, there are some things that human beings are really good at and I would say arguably we like to do. That's at the top there. So we're good at complex problem solving. We're creative. We have emotional intelligence. Uh, we're good people managers and we have this thing called judgment and decision making that, you know, computers just don't have. <laughs> well, not yet anyway. Um, so when you're thinking about process automation, we're thinking about how do we free up our time to focus on those things that we like doing and that we're good at doing uh, and leave the other things that we don't necessarily get as much enjoyment and fulfilment from to uh, algorithms and machines who can actually do it, you know, as good as or sometimes better than we can. Um, I'm talking about those repetitive high volume tasks that are very administrative in nature. And the idea here is that you create, uh, process automation creates hours to give back to the business. So it's about making your lives easier so that you can focus on other things. Um, in the service delivery office, they've had a lot of success in identifying and giving hours back to the business by taking away some of the tasks that actually people really don't like doing. Um, some of these, uh, in, in the service delivery office, they call their process automators their digital assistants. So it's one of them, I think, even has its own intray at the moment. Um, they don't make decisions. They, they do the grunt work to hand back to a human being to make decisions and they free up the human being's time to focus on those, those activities that human beings are really, really good at. 
Um, so the Productivity and Automation Centre of Excellence is looking where there are opportunities across the public service to automate some of the work that, um, th that can be automated. Um, interestingly, uh, it's created a lot of excitement among the teams who are working on it because once you get the hang of what it can do, you start to focus on the next thing that it could actually help you out with. So what's that other thing that is uh, really frustrating me and what could, what could a digital assistant actually help me out with. In addition, the, um, the capability that's required to sort of map out and come up with the ideas and implement these process automations is in growing demand, um, both in the public sector and in the private sector. And so a lot of staff have expressed interest in retraining. And we've had quite a bit of success in uh, taking staff who were previously employed in jobs like payroll um, and who have retrained to become process automators and now people are looking from outside government into us going hang on a second that's a skill set that I want. So it's definitely a skill in demand and I'm told that if you're very good at logic and process and you can actually map things out from A to B um, then this is the sort of thing that you might really um, become engaged with. What I'm going to do is show you an actual automation. Now is it working yet? No, I've got to click again. So what, what this is actually doing, it's just showing you um, quite slowly, it's reading the instructions from one side of the screen and it's enacting those instructions from another. So it's taking information, inputting it, finding the right system, connecting to that system, putting the automation in, all of those sorts of things. Now, what I showed you, you might go, oh yeah, so what? That's slowed down 1,000 times. So when you think about if you were the human being that was going into these systems, which was previously the case for this particular function, you would be doing this manually yourself, setting up your letters, doing all those sorts of things. Um, you've told the computer now what you need it to do. It's managing those systems. It runs overnight and it hands it back to you the next day. So it's really exciting when you think about how that could transform what we're doing. And I don't think it's something that we need to be afraid of because we need people who can come up with the ideas of what to automate um, and then we need to actually implement the automations and that, as I said, it frees up your time to be focused on the things, you know, all that, that pile of other work that you really want to get to that you just never seem to have a chance to do. Um, Another project, so the modernisation fund I spoke of earlier, has taken uh, not only process automation but is really getting into machine learning and sort of the pushing it towards the intelligence side of the spectrum. So um, the NHMRC, the National Health and Medical Research Council, is looking at how you can actually use the tools and technology that we have to make uh, research grants um, work to actually optimise the process of awarding research grants. So in this case, uh, they're using, uh, as I said, machine learning and process automation. Getting in the grant applications, they look at those and uh, the system will actually distribute the grant applications to a reviewer that has the identified prerequisite academic skills and qualifications. So it recommends who should be the reviewer and it also looks at their availability and capacity to review the grants. Um, it also then identifies things like when you're looking at grant applications and particularly in the research field, it looks at where there might be a potential conflict of interest. So where um, certain people who are applying for grants have received uh, funding or of publications in other areas, it's trawling through a lot of unstructured data to provide advice back to the users about whether or not someone might have a conflict of interest. So again, it's not doing the thinking and it's not applying the judgment, but it's doing that, um, that work that is required underneath and in the background a lot more quickly to deliver to the person who is the decision maker and who has to apply the judgment to it. So that's one of the projects in the modernisation fund. And going from data to orbiting satellites, um, I thought this one was a nice example. Uh, this hasn't been completely funded through the Modernisation Fund, but it did receive some funding from the Mod Fund to sort of push it forward. Um, and it's all about how we're using, we're making available to uh, farmers, researchers and public servants um, the sort of data that they can really use from satellite imagery. So I'll just play this one for you. One of the biggest challenges with satellite data is that it's massive. There are petabytes of data of this rich, rich information, but it's so large and quite often it's so complex that it's incredibly difficult to use. 
What we've done through the Digital Earth Australia program is take that data, correct it, calibrate it and organise it so that it's easy to use and easy to have more people immediately start to extract value from this data. We use it quite a lot already and the potential is enormous. We use it to monitor water holdings. So there is a what's called a Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder in the department. They purchase and release water to help balance out how water across the continent is for agriculture, for communities and for industry, but also for the environment. In the past, remote sensing was cost prohibitive to industry to access. Now data is open and free, making it fully accessible. We'll identify new markets where consumers can actually use remote sensing in areas they haven't done in the past, use particular applications, whether it's through smart devices to identify changes on the ground, whether it's relating to land changes or water quality changes. It's really a great opportunity for industry to, to be able to leverage off this open source data set what we're hoping to do with industry is actually make a range of tools available for customised use. So you can imagine a farmer having a tool to track his own irrigation scheduling or his own crop uh, development. Likewise, you can imagine an individual landholder tracking the progress of their development or even to target which property they buy next and what the risk of flood is for that. We see many, many applications, there's many opportunities for budding entrepreneurs to actually take this information and turn it into uh, services for the general public. Okay, so that's Digital Earth. One more project that I'll quickly share with you. Um, the productivity pilot. So the APSC is working with finance and um, agencies, so quite a lot of agencies involved in this one, to look at that rich source of data that we do have through the APS census. So there are certain things that uh, correlate very highly with productivity and one of those is how well staff are engaged but there's also things about you know capability building learning and development all of those things that we know actually build more productive um, and happy teams so um, the productivity pilot is taking some of the data that we have through the um, through the uh, APS census and is looking for examples of where we might find um, real drivers of productivity. So I won't go into too much detail on this one, just to say that if you're thinking about, you know, well, what's the point? Yes, data's wonderful. Um, what we're actually doing is looking for case studies. Um, when you find out where those drivers are, you can actually identify, you can start to build case studies that reach out and tell stories of where there are really highly productive teams. Well, what is it that they're actually doing. And a quick example of that is um, when you think about uh, access to tools and resources as being something that when there's a positive correlation between if you feel you have access to the right tools and resources, uh, that you're usually more engaged in your work. Um, in the APS census, I was struck by how different the responses were when I went out to my teams and said, when you say you don't really think that you've got access to the right tools and resources, what are you talking about? At the individual team level, for every team it was something different. For one team it was the fact that the IT system wasn't giving them what they needed. For another team it was the fact that they couldn't find the information in the records keeping system. For another team it was simply um, access to material that they could reuse. So when you start drilling down to the team level on this data you get to get some real insights and what we're hoping to do is create some very tangible real case studies that will help you and all of the APS unlock the productivity of staff. So in conclusion, we'd really love to uh, meet with you in GovTeams. So if you go to Modernising the Public Sector Community. Uh, if you have questions directly for my team, there's an email address there. And we will start showcasing and sharing some of those case studies and great examples of work that's already underway in a website that's coming soon. We're planning to have a bit of an expo uh, probably in the Jalambani Centre in early March, where we'll get booths set up and we'll, have, uh, we'll invite you all to come through and actually see some of these projects in action and then we'll start creating uh, material that we can have online that you can all have a look at. So thank you.
thanks so much, Rena. That was great. And I've got uh, some personal knowledge of a couple of the initiatives you outlined, and uh, it's actually fantastic to see the innovation and the really different thinking starting to come to light, and particularly the use of data, which I think is an emerging opportunity uh, for us. So, look, I'd like to now invite uh, not just Rena, but also Peter, Will, and Helen, uh, Helen Bull, um, up to the stage, if I could please, for the Q&A session. So as these colleagues uh, make their way up to the stage and grab a seat, um, hopefully all of you have been busy lodging questions on Slido. I've been keeping a weather eye on Slido and there are a few questions rolling through um, and the APSC team has been trying to distill them a bit for us because I know we often get questions which are similar so I think the team's been trying to just uh, remove duplicates so we still keep the essence of a few questions without having different variants of it. Um, we are going to now work through um, roughly by popularity, um, but also depending on where the discussion goes, some of these questions. Um, we did originally plan about half an hour. We don't quite have as much time as that as we originally hoped. So we'll probably go for about 10, 10 or 15 minutes ago, 10 or 15 minutes or so, something like that. So first of all, um, I'm going to start with the obvious, which is the one that has uh, the most votes and rising, which is how do you propose we better communicate our service to the public when APS social media guidelines effectively prevent any communication of our work? Now, Peter or Helen, I might ask one of you to have a go at this. You might like to look at whether you agree with the question and or give a view on, on uh, what we might do. So over to perhaps Helen or Peter in the first instance. Okay, look, uh, thanks, Jill. I might take that. Is this on? Yes, it is. Good. A <clears throat> uh, couple of aspects. Uh, as most of you will know, there's actually a high court case being considered at the moment in regard to um, a particular case involving the use of social media. Uh, and they're looking to balance that, that High Court case is considering how you balance the implied right of freedom of expression in a democratic society with obviously the obligations to be an impartial public service and not political. So that's quite, I mean, obviously we'll need to wait to see what that High Court decision says. But, uh, but I think there's a, there's a pretty straightforward point I'd like to make here though. And when you communicate with the public on social media, when we need to sell ourselves and what we do, uh, that's not about being political. That's not about being critical of government or being, being a political person. A lot of what we do in the APS has nothing to do with politics. It's about delivery. It's about uh, providing services. It's, it's about regulation. It's about enforcement. It's essentially an enormous array of activities, and I sought to try and highlight that a bit in my speech. So much of what we do is just, non, it's just not political. And there is that issue around the political aspect of it, and I said the High Court is dealing with that. But I think there's a real story we have to tell, and it's whether it's people who have, have been awarded PSMs or people who have just done extraordinary things in terms of work in local communities. These are the stories we need to get out and talk about ourselves a bit more and about what we do. That's important in terms of why we're in the public service, but it's also important in terms of why we're going to be able to attract uh, talented people in the future because they want to make a contribution. And it's that that I'm, I'm talking about. So I don't actually see there being a real issue here between, um, as I say, the issues around more political commentary around in social media and the messages we need to be promulgating to the community about the sort of work we do. But I might give the microphone to uh, anyone else who wants to comment. Just um, adding to that, I think one of the ways that we can communicate every single interaction that we have with our stakeholders who are not in the APS speaks volumes. So if you're thinking about um, the work that you're doing every day and how you interact with stakeholders, don't underestimate the impact of that communication uh, in terms of building trust and making them see that you're genuine about your work. Um, you can build relationships in a way that commun can communicate volumes. All right, we might go, I think, to the next question. Will, I might um, ask you to have an initial stab at this one. I think you touched on it briefly, actually, in some of your comments. Question is uh, obviously really topical. What impact would a change of government have on the progression of APS reforms in 2019? So, of course, all governments will have their priorities and, and interests, uh, but, but the important point for the, the review is that the opposition welcomed the review when it was announced uh, last year 
and has continued to support its work. Uh, the opposition has put out a number of, you know, n number of uh, comments about uh, the sort of policies with relationship with relation to the APS that it would pursue if elected. Uh, but um, I think for, for us, the underlying for the review panel, the underlying point is that the opposition supports the review and is committed to both its reason for being and to uh, helping deliver it. I might just add to what Will said, is that, um, I mean, government wants a strong public service. I mean, things work best when the public service, when ministers' offices and ministers all work seamlessly together. And both sides of politics understand the forces at, at which are changing the way we have to operate as governments in, in the world. And I think that uh, my own sense is I'd agree with Will that I don't think it would have, they would all have been their own particular approaches to reform and, and to uh, what they would like to see if, if, um, when they're in government. But I don't think it would have a, a it certainly wouldn't hold back the reform, the, the, the drive and the momentum for reform in the system. I might uh, now just pop Rena down to the bottom of the screen. Um, you know, this is the latest question. It's already receiving quite a few votes and going up. How do we improve communication and engagement across agencies when in our own departments this is something we can struggle with? Good question. <laughs> I don't know that GovTeams is going to be the answer to everything, <laughs> but it's certainly encouraging a different way to think about communication. Um, I think it's up to each and every one of us to be thinking consciously about who within our own organisations do we need to consult with and collaborate with um, and who within other organisations do we need to consult with and collaborate with. I think our secretaries, because they come together in forums such as the Secretary's APS Reform Committee, are demonstrating from the top that they believe that we need to collaborate. There is the, the coming together and the solving of problems together and they expect that we will do likewise. Um, sometimes it's the the fact that we are so large and complex and one of the challenges for working in the government is that stakeholder relations are, are large and complex and you actually have to give real thought to how you work with one another. Um, in the Department of Finance we have been thinking about this and we've been doing some targeted training. Um, so we have uh, particular training that we're now and we've had very good feedback from EL and APS staff on how do you consciously think about uh, uh, engaging with people in a meaningful way and improving communication channels. Yeah, look, just on that, sort of on a personal reflection here for a moment, um, diplomatic service, when you get posted overseas, um, you're, it's all about building networks of influence. You go, over, you go to wherever you're posted and your job is to be able to influence people in that country in relation to Australia's interests. So you, you spend your whole time there developing these networks, developing these contacts. And I've got to say, when you come back, you tend to forget all that stuff. It's, you, it's not, you just get back into your sort of silo. And, you, and I think there's a lot we can learn, actually, from the DFAT approach to when it goes overseas, not necessarily from when it's back in Canberra. We need to be much better at networking. As public servants, we need to be much better dealing with stakeholders. We actually need to understand the importance of networking, of, get, of being able to talk to people and being able to reach across not only departments and agencies, but actually into the community. And I think that's a skill that is going to be increasingly uh, in demand in the years ahead. I might uh, go back to normal ordering then and just turn to um, a question which is outsourcing has been a common theme in recent decades. How does that square with an emphasis on capability? And the proposal is the APS as becoming contract managers, not content experts. So I'm wondering, Helen or Peter, if you wanted to have a stab at that initially or... Rena, you've got the um, mic. I think the outsourcing part came to me. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> um, yeah, so as you know, um, the swing between outsourcing and in insourcing, uh, there is a pendulum there and it does swing backwards and forwards. Uh, at the moment, um, there is a, a desire to think about what are the, uh, the 
functions that are best taken uh, within the public service, but then where, where do we need to apply contestability and where do we need to look at what should be delivered outside of the public service? Um, when you listen to the Minister for Finance and the Public Service talk, he will talk about the fact that he wants a, and he believes in a very capable public sector, but believes that there are some things that the public sector um, we cannot retain or build the skills in the same way that the private sector could. So when you're looking at um, some of the skill sets that we have, uh, we as a public sector may not be able to maintain them as efficiently and effectively as the, public sec as the private sector. And in those cases, it does make sense for us to tap into what the private sector can offer us. Um, and also when the nature of that work is non-ongoing or temporary in nature. So, um, but Yes, there's a debate about how far the pendulum should swing and uh, to what extent do we can't become uh, the brokers of different capabilities and skills rather than having those in-house. In and I know that the review um, is asking that question and also the Secretary's Committee on APS uh, Reform is looking at um, a whole of government workforce strategy. So to actually look at all departments and agencies sort of have their... Um, their uh, workforce strategies, but we don't necessarily have one that sits as an umbrella across the APS. And so we need to think ourselves about what is the capability we need to do our jobs as they are now. And then we're looking to the review to give us some hints about um, how do we actually put ourselves in good stead to be ready for the jobs that we will have in uh, 2030, for example. Yeah, these are, these are really astute questions. Um, this is one of the things that the reviews heard lots about, um, and there's a there's a, a line of received wisdom that the uh, capability of the APS has been winnowed out or hollowed out because of uh, outsourcing. It's a bit difficult, you know. We're, we're obviously looking into that really deeply. It's difficult to quite pin it down so uh, clearly. Um, it's difficult to measure changes in capability. Uh, it's difficult to disassociate. Uh, change in capability from change in uh, the political environment, which makes it harder to get good policy done. Uh, suffice to say that it's, it's front and centre of the review panel's mind. Uh, some early thoughts of the review panel are that, um, uh, that, that we need clearly to lift the APS's capability to do what we need to do into the future. The second point, a concern that, that whatever happens with outsourcing, whenever this pe pendulum goes, you've got to have an effective APS to be able to manage this. You, 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 you can't outsource fundamental responsibilities and nor can you outsource responsibilities without a sense of how to, how to manage, control and direct those. And to that you need a degree of content expertise to do that. Uh, and a, 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 a final observation is a question that, that David Thady has asked is, well, what capabilities does the APS presently have and need? And of course the answer is that the APS doesn't presently know that at an institutional level. The answer may be found at an agency by agency level if the, if the agency has done effective workforce planning and, and forecasting. Uh, but as an institution we have limited uh, some but, but uh, not wholly satisfactory insights into both of those questions. So I think we've probably got time for one more question and so I'll just go to the next most uh, frequently voted one. Really important one. How do we make sure that those who do not have access to technology, particularly those who might be disadvantaged, elderly, those in regional or remote areas, are not left behind by government? Who would like to have? Peter, did you want oh, to? I, I'll have first shot of that. Um, I think there are two aspects to this question. It's a, it's a very important question too. Um, those who are generally don't have access to technology because they're in very remote or regional parts of Australia, um, obviously you need to set up other systems to manage that caseload um, where you don't have the technological reach. But where you do have the technological reach but you're dealing with people who may be old, uh, they, may be, uh, they may have disabilities of, so, of, of some nature, then it's a question of, of actually making sure that the technology you're providing is tested with them, is road tested with them, is designed with them, so that they're brought into the, they're brought into 
the overall design of the system so that you can set up those technologies in a way which the, they can then access. I think that's the critical part there. It's sort of it's co-design. Um, now, there will be those who just simply can't, of course, um, manage that. They may be too old or they may be too infirm. But then again, you need to you have your other systems. But I think there's a lot we can do around co-design which would get around the issue of those who are just challenged by, by technology. But I might pass it to others too. Um, I'm just reflecting on the fact that, you know, technology can actually also open up real opportunities for some people with disability. So we had um, uh, the Human Rights Commissioner um, uh, come out and speak to us the other day, um, who, as you know, is um, vision impaired. And um, just the the things that that technology enables um, people with certain disabilities to do to operate in the same way that they they would if they actually didn't have a disability. So I agree that the technology has to be designed um, with those users in mind, and there needs to be a change management and education process. But I also think that we need to think about technology as a way of um, creating opportunities for people who may otherwise not have them. I'd only add some very, very just um, minor comments, which is uh, essentially that technology is a is a tool that the APS can choose how and when and we use it, and uh, it's one of the fundamental challenges then for the review is is uh, and, and ultimately for the government that that deals with the review is what what attitude what disposition does the AP, should the APS have with using technology. Uh, Technology can help find the people who are falling through the cracks. It can free up uh, a workforce to move from processing information and data and claim forms to case managing and working with those individuals. Uh, so it may be that technology is, is actually a tool to deliver more face-to-face -face and more personalised service for those people who really, really need it. Unfortunately, that is all that we have time for this afternoon in terms of questions. But thank you all so much for your excellent questions, um, not all of which we could unfortunately get to. Um, but could you please join with me first in thanking our speakers and panellists. So I'm sure you would all uh, agree with me that it's been a really interesting afternoon. I think there's tremendous opportunity coming up in this calendar year for the Australian Public Service and I think we've had a taste of a lot of pieces of that puzzle today. Don't forget copies of today's presentations will be available uh, later to download from the event app which you should all have. So uh, you'll be able to get all of those PowerPoint presentations then. Um, and again, many thanks for your attendance today. I hope you found it as valuable as I'm sure I have, and I wish you all the best for the rest of the day. Thank you.